Would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 21 and verses 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 8. This is God's infallible and authoritative word. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And thus far in the reading of God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, be pleased to bless us this evening as we hear the word of God. May it speak to us, may it comfort us, and may it challenge us. And in so doing, bring us closer to yourself. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I wonder how many of you want to go to heaven. I would like to hold a vote, but uh, I don't think I will do that because uh, some of you won't know what you're voting for, as you will find out as time goes on. But everybody, I think, wants to go to heaven. I've never heard anybody say, except for a stunt, I suppose, that they want to go to hell. Most people want to go to heaven. All people believe they deserve to go to heaven. Nobody ever questions that they should go to heaven. And we're told that they go to heaven. We, uh, some of us who are ministers and elders have been present in homes uh, where there was no sign of godliness at all. And they ask you, do you, you know, they say, we know that, uh, that Joe or Jim or Jane or whatever, they've gone to heaven, you know. And uh, you're left with having to either bite your tongue or to say to them, well, maybe that's not true. And, uh, and of course, when you say that, they look at you as though you're uh, slightly insane. I mean, everybody who dies goes to heaven. But that's not true. And if any of you think that you go to heaven by right, then you're wrong. And we see something of what heaven is like in this passage that we have before us. And who may go there? John is writing this after uh, describing the history of the world, basically. That's what Revelation is about. It's the history of the world, and of the different forces that are at work in our world, and the different uh, um, equipment, and the different talents, and the different gifts that God has given into the world in order to stem the tide of evil that is here. And we see that throughout the first uh, uh, 20 chapters of, of Revelation. And then in chapters 19 through 20, uh, we've seen the judgment, the end of all things. Uh, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing over the throne. 
and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. This is the end of time. This is what's going to inevitably happen. And now John, in his vision, is summing up what has been said in the previous uh, 20 chapters. And he does so, or the Holy Spirit does so, in revealing this to him in, in three different ways. First of all, he describes to us in verse 1 that history will end. The life that we're living, the world that we're living in, is going to end. Now, it may not end in our time. We may indeed uh, outlast uh, much of what goes on. Some of the children here will live many, many years, I hope, and I hope they will live godly lives, and I hope they will live lives that pre, uh, prefigures what heaven is going to be like. Some of us are much older, and we will not see many more years or many more sunrises. But the truth of the matter is that unless Christ comes, we will all die. And this is what this first verse is about. That there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I see a new heaven and a new earth. Well, what is this new heaven and new earth like? Well, it's going to be in contrast to the world that is, is, is ended. This is the whole point. We, we, we see it later when he talks about a new Jerusalem. It's, it's in contrast to the old Jerusalem. The old Jerusalem, why it's been a place of, of, of opposition to the gospel. It's been a place of condemnation of truth. And it's been the place where Christ was crucified. This is what happens in the old Jerusalem. But now there comes a new Jerusalem. And the history of the world is going to end. And its end will be remarkable. What do we read here? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth, heaven and the first earth has passed away. Now what he's telling us is that this new heaven and this new earth will not simply be a reconditioned world. It isn't as though God is going to tinker a bit with this and clean up a bit of that and get rid of uh, all the waste in the water and uh, make sure that the trees don't, don't die because of, of, of global warming and, uh, and a few things like that. It's going to be new. It's going to be like, but it's going to be new. Totally different. Totally renewed. And it's going to be a new heaven. And there's going to be a new earth. The, the earth will be changed. But the heavens will still be heavens. But now there will be an interact, inter interaction between heaven and earth. It will be possible, uh, I, I am assuming, that, that the powers of heaven will be very evident in the life we live on earth. It's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And it's going to be splendid to enjoy and to dwell in. And the first heaven and the first earth are passed away. It's like death. It'll be gone. And there will be no more sea. Now, why add that? Well, you live close to the sea here. You, uh, we've driven over the, this big river, Neuse, uh, twice today. And it's big and uh, it's nothing compared with the ocean, is it? Well, what does the ocean signify? Well, the ocean signifies in Scripture a place of unrest, a place of division, and a place of suffering. That's what the ocean can, uh, signifies in the Scripture. It's a place of unrest. It's always on the move. Isaiah in Isaiah 57 tells us that the, the wicked are like the sea. They, they, they never stop. They're always tossing back and forth. Uh, back in, in, uh, in December, uh, we were privileged to spend a few days in, in, uh, in Florida. And we stayed in, a, in an apartment overlooking the ocean. And, and the waves came in. It was magnificent. 
It was a magnificent uh, ocean to see. The, the waves came in every day, every day, every hour, every minute, every second. Waves were coming in when, when there was turbulence outside, the, uh, outside on the ocean. Uh, the waves were a bit bigger. And then when it was quiet, it was pacified. But they were always on the move. Always on the move. Well, in the heaven, in the new heaven, and the new earth, there will be no ocean. There will be no uncertainty. There will be no uh, moving around. There will be total change. It will be a different world. This new heaven and this new earth will be remarkable. And heaven will have been formed according to divine purpose. Because it's going to be the place where God and his people are going to dwell together. There's no division. There will be unity. The, the ocean divides us now, does it not? I come from, uh, from the United Kingdom. I come from Wales. And there's 3,000 miles of ocean. I remember very well uh, flying over to Canada for the first time back in, in the 80s. And I never realized there was so much water. I never really, I looked out of the plane window after an hour and there was water and, and oh, it was moving. Like you could see that even from the plane. And, and, uh, and then uh, two hours later, I'd been to sleep and I woke up and it was still water. There's so much ocean dividing countries. And the reason why America exists is because of that division. Were there no ocean dividing America from Great Britain? there would have been no American war of independence. Of that, you can be sure. It's a dividing factor. Well, now it will cease. Heaven will be a place where there is no division. Now, can you imagine that kind of place? All of us look to the future. And there will be death. And there will be separation. And uh, parents will leave children. Uh, children, I hope, will have grown before their parents die. And you children will grow up and hopefully you will become parents. But you will die and you'll be separated from your children. And so it goes on. But there will be no separation. New heaven and a new earth. For the first earth and the first heaven have passed away and the sea is no more. That's the first thing to learn about heaven then. It ends according to God's purpose. It's a, a wonderful new world. But it is God's world. And it's not yours, nor is it mine. The second thing we see here is that this new heaven and this new earth is going to be a world where there is peace. Look, we're told, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, <clears throat> prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is going to be a new world order. Heaven is a place to be desired. You should want to go to heaven. I've just said everybody wants to go to heaven and indeed people should want to go to heaven but do they realize that's the kind of world it's going to be? It's going to be a world where God is in its heart and in its entirety. It's come out of heaven from God and I heard a loud voice saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God is there. Now, this is a fulfillment of what Isaiah promised in chapter 65 and 66. The true bride of Christ is to be seen there. The church in its glory and in its majesty is there. You will find there all the company of the redeemed. There's no proving ground. People don't have to stay in purgatory to get ready to come to heaven. 
all the redeemed of God will be there. And God will be its focal point in his splendor, in his majesty, in his triuneness. God will be there. And so it's going to be a place for the believer, a place of remarkable peace and remarkable comfort. Because God is there. It will not be there because there's been a conference or a treaty. But it's the rule of God, the presence of Christ, and the all-benevolent Holy Spirit achieving true blessings in this new world. And people will be there. We're told here, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. It's not with men as individuals. It's with man as an entirety. The people, the, 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 the People of God, the, those who believe in him, those uh, the church of God, they will all be there. And God will be there. But there will be people there. Heaven is going to be a place where there are people. It's going to be populated. And that's going to be remarkable. Because as we live on this fallen world, people come and people go. I mentioned that already this evening. But there, there will be no death. There will be no end. The people of God will be there and they will be greeting and, and welcoming and fellowshipping with each other because they are the bride of Christ and they will be beautiful and perfect and matchless. Will they learn anything? Sure. They will learn more and more of the mercy and the grace and the love of Christ. They will tell their story constantly before each other. They will fellowship with each other. There will be no tears there. He will wipe away their tears. There'll be no grief there. There won't be any presiding over deathbeds. There'll be no more call for funeral services. There'll be no crematoria or cemeteries. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. You've heard tonight of someone from your number who's going to be in a hospital and, and having uh, some surgery. Um, this is Ash's uh, field of expertise. Um, I've been at the hands of surgeons in, in the course of the last year, or less than a year since I was here, and uh, I'm thankful to God for such skillful men. But there won't be any of that in this world. There'll be no pain anymore. It'll all be done with. And the former things, all the things that are described in Revelation 1 through 20, will be gone. All the suffering, all the idolatry, all the blasphemy, all the opposition to God, all the uh, debate about the existence of grace and mercy, the, all of these things will be gone. There'll be no more. There will be heaven. Now, we've already mentioned, and uh, I will, of course, to say more about that in a moment. There is another world, but there will be a world that is without fault or blame or suffering. And this world will be a place where the triune God is worshipped. Notice. And he who's seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is what heaven is like. God is there. And he is worshipped. Worshipped by people who have been justified by faith, who have believed him and have known that he and he alone can take away their sins, can place them firmly upon Christ and punish Christ on the behalf of his people. It'll be a world of the adopted, being brought into the fellowship of God and belonging to the bride and part of God's precious Delivery to his people. He has justified them. 
And it's a place where faithfulness to the covenant will be rewarded. God will be pleased to have his people who have followed carefully in his footsteps and have trusted in him by faith. This is the place where God is truly worshipped. We like to think we worship God pretty faithfully, and I believe we do. I believe that um, uh, there are many churches where God is faithfully worshipped. We are glad of them. But you know, that worship is blemished by our sin. We are not able to think properly. Very often you come on a Sunday morning and your mind is, uh, is elsewhere. And on a Sunday evening, your mind is on tomorrow, another week, another thing to do, another things to, uh, to tackle, uh, another places to go and people to see. So often we are not worshipping with all our heart, our soul, our mind and our strength. But when we come to this world, why we will worship without blemish. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, we'll say. The beginning and the end. We see him for who he is. And we'll realize for what he's done. Look, he says, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. We talked about the water this morning in, in, in John 7 and in John 9. We read of it this evening in John 7, that, that Christ will be there satisfying our greatest needs. If someone says to you, well, what are we going to eat in heaven? We'll eat the bread of life. We'll drink the water of life. We will be refreshed constantly by what God has provided for us. It will be the place where God in all his majesty and power will care for us and tenderly uphold us. But there is another thing about heaven. Not everybody's going to be there. Not all of us here this evening. I hope and pray that you will be. But there's no way of guaranteeing that unless you are come to Christ. Because look what he says here. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Those who have denied the faith. He's not talking about people who are pagans. He's not talking about people who are um, brandishing clubs and, and machine guns and, 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 and running riot against people. He's not talking about those. He's talking about people who have heard the word. But they are people, we are told, who are cowardly. They've refused to stand with Christ. They've been afraid to bear the shame that comes with professing his name. It will come to those who have been faithless. They have heard the word of God. They've been appealed to. They've, they've been asked, you children, all of you think about these things very seriously tonight. You've all heard from your parents. You've heard from this pulpit. You've heard from the people of God who have preached to you. And you've been called to repent and to believe and to trust and to live a life that's consistent with it. I was reading just recently about uh, a soccer player. I don't do much with soccer, but uh, I was reading about soccer players who start their training at four and five years of age. There are schools for soccer players in Italy and in Spain and in England. And they, 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 they nab young people who are talented children and they, they make promises to their parents and, and the children are, are, are taken on as contract employees even though they're so little and small so that they will be able to contribute something to the big teams as time goes on. Well, do you know, this is what the church does. 
It teaches you. It instructs you. You children, you are taught from the pulpit. But will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? Will you betray what you've been called to listen to? Because if you will betray it, if you will be faithless, you will be amongst those who are excluded from heaven. The detestable people whose behavior is disgusting, people whose opposition is appalling, whose hatred of God and of his grace is despicable, those people will be excluded. They're detestable. And he goes on to say, what are these people like? They are murderers. And you may say, well, I've never committed murder. Really? I think the Lord Jesus Christ defines that by saying that if we think evil of a person, we've killed them. Isn't that a solemnizing thought? If we see a woman to, to lust after her, we've committed adultery with her. What's here? The sexually immoral, sorcerers, people who have thought that they can use the name of God as magic, that they can simply say, I believe in God, and God's not going to harm me, and therefore God won't harm me. That's not true. There must be a relationship with the Lord God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Idolaters. What, what's the most important thing in your life? Every one of you. Is it, is it your car, or your status, or your, your wealth, or your, your position in society? Or what is the most important thing? Or are you an idolater? Do you have an idol? What is it uh, uh, John uh, Newton said? Talks about idols. Uh, Whate'er those idols be, help me to tear them from thy throne and worship only thee. Do you have idols? See? And all liars. As a, as a parent and as a grandparent, one of the hard things is to see a child, a grandchild, who says unremitting lies. I've seen it, and it cuts me to the quick. See it in other children. It hurts me to see children who are liars, who say untruths, who, who refuse to admit to their own sin and, 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 and blame other people and other children for the sins that they commit. All this, he says, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You'll all die one death. Of that, it's inevitable. But there is a second death. And this is the most terrible death of all, when God rejects and we are not any longer allowed into his presence. There's a place for the ungodly. He puts this in, you see. The Holy Spirit, as he inspires John, puts it in right in the heart of this passage about heaven. And why is he doing that? Well, heaven is real. And he wants us to understand it's a wonderful place to be. There's nothing more wonderful than to contemplate heaven. <clears throat> it may not come in the sense of, uh, of the end of the world in your time. It may be that the end of the world will come many millennia from now. But all of us, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, why, we will go to heaven when we die. We won't go anywhere else. We'll go to heaven. There's no waiting room. We'll go to heaven. It's wonderful to contemplate that that's the case. And the closer we get to heaven, the more we think about it. You might think you're young. Some of you are children. And as you're listening to me, you're wondering, well, it's not going to happen to me for a long time. No, no, I hope not. I hope you get to grow up and to be young men and young women and middle-aged men and middle-aged women and, and old men and old women and be parents and grandparents and all those nice things. But there will be an end. 
is your contemplation for the future of a place of wonderful and glorious heaven? Is it going to be a place of unspeakable joy for you to be in the presence of Christ and to see him in all his majesty, see God, the triune God, and recognize them as the ones who have saved you and guarded you and kept you? Are you looking forward to that? But there's also the note of, of, of warning. There is a hell. There is a separation. There is a place where God is not. Do you realize that? And all the blessings you have from God, uh, of loving family and of, of loving uh, gifts and of, of provisions from God's providence, they will not exist any longer. It'll be a place of utter darkness. It's a death and Hades is there. He's thrown into the lake of fire, says the last verse uh, in, in the previous chapter. Have you realized that that is there and exists? Is heaven then something you desire? If it is, then I beg you, all of you, Make sure of your saving interest in Jesus Christ. Make sure that he is close to you. Make sure that he is the topic of your conversation, the interest of your mind, the hope of your heart, and that you turn and gaze upon him and be thrilled at the thought of all he's done for you. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God and Heavenly Father, bless us now and give to us a vision of heaven in all its majesty and grace. We thank you for warning us that there is a terrible place and we are grateful that you've put up warning signs along our journey to tell us to beware. Help us tonight to heed those warning signs and to be concerned only to be in your presence and with you in your majesty and power. We pray this in the name of our Saviour, the only one who can take us into that wonderful heaven, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.